Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd Seminary. This podcast is dedicated to discussing issues related to scripture and theology. For more information, visit petergaiman.com. Welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to talk about discernment, and the reason why I'm so excited to talk about this, well, it's twofold. I'll give you two reasons why I'm so excited to talk about this. On the one hand, I was asked to talk about this at one of the Shepherd's Bible Studies, one of the women's Bible studies. They asked me to come and talk about discernment, and as I was thinking through how I wanted to do that, I just found it really helpful to to ask some questions and work through that, and I got a lot of good feedback from that Bible study. And I was just encouraged and thought that this might be a good episode as well. Now, coupled along with that, the second reason is that in general, discernment is a very unknown, unexplored category of thought. I think everybody acknowledges in the Christian world that discernment is important. And I think most people would say they want to be a discerning individual, but I just, in my experience, and I think in many Christians' experiences, as they look around at their fellow brothers and sisters, there is a lack of knowledge and ignorance about maybe even what discernment is and how that can be practiced. So that's the goal of today's episode, as it may be. All we're going to try to do is look at what is discernment. We're going to ask some questions about discernment and try to think through it from a biblical lens. Okay, so what is discernment? That's the first question that we need to ask. What is discernment? And if you run a simple Bible search in your English Bible software, and I use the ESV for this search, there are only nine uses of the verb or noun discern, to discern as a verb or discernment as a, as a noun. And there are only nine uses in the New Testament. And so there are a few other uses in the Old Testament as well. But just thinking about it from a New Testament perspective, this, is, this isn't this is a word that shows up uh, quite a bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's used very rarely, uh, holistically. And yet, one of the things that I think is helpful to understand is that discernment, when you start to go behind the English of the ESV, for example, and other translations could be filled in here as well, When you go behind the idea of what discernment is and you go into the Greek word groups or the Hebrew word groups, in this case, I just ran a search on the New Testament, there are over a hundred uses of the word groups that are used and translated as discernment. Now, what you will most often find is a word that perhaps you don't associate with discernment, but I want to read a passage to illustrate how this works. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15, I want to illustrate how this translation of discernment plays into the concept of the Greek word group being translated later on. So in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 2, this is, this is a verse which we'll come back to, but just for setting the definition of what is discernment, it says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, so that's a usage of the verbal form of discern. They are spiritually discerned. So in other words, somebody does not understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. But then in verse 15, we are told the spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. And what is interesting, perhaps, to the English reader is that the phrase, they are spiritually discerned, and then the very next phrase of verse 15, the spiritual person judges all things, those are the same verbs. They both come from the verbal form of anacrino, to judge or to discern. And what we quickly realize in comparing the Greek words with their English counterparts, how they're often translated, is that discernment, as it's typically translated and understood in English, is related to the concept of judging. It's related to the concept of judging. So if, you, if you're having a hard time just grappling with what discernment is, just think about it at its very core. It's to exhibit judgment. In fact, 
uh, if you look it up in an English dictionary, you actually find the same idea. In the American Heritage Dictionary, uh, it says discernment is the act or process of exhibiting keen insight and good judgment. So in other words, judging and discernment go hand in hand. Okay, they go hand in hand. They're they're two, the, essentially the same concept. Discernment is just a heightened form of judging. Now, what's interesting about this is that I remember talking to a newer believer, and I've probably had this conversation multiple times, but I just remember recently I've had this conversation, and I remember this newer believer was talking about others who claimed to be Christians, but they weren't living that way. They weren't living like believers. And I remember specifically one of the things that he said was, now I know I'm not supposed to judge them. Or he said, I, I know that I know that's not my place to judge. And I remember thinking to myself, and I stopped him in, in the conversation, I said, Why do you say that? Why do you say it's not your place to judge? And he was kind of taken aback a little bit because he was thinking, Well, no, everybody knows that you're not supposed to judge one another. Like that's that's just not that's just not right. And I think we all kind of know that the world's favorite Bible verse, everybody knows this verse, even if they're not Christians, is Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged, right? That's Matthew 7, 1, judge not lest you be judged. And so people just assume and just say, oh, we're not to judge one another. Don't judge, don't judge. And yet we just read in 1 Corinthians 2, 15, that the spiritual person judges all things. That's really exclusive. And what's also interesting is Paul has, has a further comment in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, that maybe a lot of people ignore, where Paul says to the Corinthian believers, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those who are the outside. And so when you read those verses, uh, I think it's, and by the way, that's a rhetorical question with an implied answer of, yes, you are to judge those who are in the church. So in other words, even in Paul's writing, he assumes and uses as the basis for his argument that you are to judge individuals. And so in one sense, I think it's kind of funny to highlight the fact that when you're, when you're thinking about discernment and what discernment actually is, you are actually practicing and becoming a judge of people and of actions. And I think that that's actually important to understand and just say up front is that, yes, discernment is the act of judging, evaluating people and actions. And that is a big part of the Christian experience. Now, just to go back to Matthew 7, just really briefly, I think it's always important just to look at the context. And of course, the judgment that Jesus is talking about there is the hypocritical judgment. Verse 5, he says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, what he's saying there is that you do need to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You do need to be able to make that evaluation and judgment and help your brother. But you have to, you have to first deal with your own problems. That doesn't mean you don't deal with the problems of your brother and you don't judge. It just means that you first judge yourself and then you judge. So the, the statement, judge not lest you be judged in Matthew 7, 1 is very clearly qualified in context as a hypocritical judgment. And even in verse 6, the following verse in context, don't give what is holy to the dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine. Well, that context in and of itself also is assuming the fact that you have the capacity to evaluate persons and their character so that you don't throw what is holy before the dogs, so that you don't uh, share with somebody who is unworthy uh, the good news of the gospel and with so somebody that's going to just turn around and trample it. Uh, that, that's a hard saying, and you need to have discernment to be able to do that. And so to just take wholesale the phrase, judge not lest you be judged, is is uh, wrong-headed and completely out of context. Scripture is very clear that Christians are to be very, very discerning. They are to be judges of people. And that's that sounds so so off to us because our culture has influenced us so greatly. But again, I just remind us that this is indication that we're being influenced by our culture, 
not necessarily by scripture. So we really need to look to scripture to talk about what is discernment, what does it look like, how do we practice that, etc. So what is discernment? Discernment is simply a good, keen, insightful judgment. Okay, that's what discernment is. Now, the next question as we think about this would be who can practice discernment? So who can practice discernment? And one of the things to keep in mind here is that there is there is an element of wisdom that God has given to humanity at large. Proverbs talks about this. We see this with our own eyes. We experience this where, where individuals who are not Christian can have a wisdom where they discern, oh, I see somebody who's doing something and that's indicative of them lying. Or that's, I see the telltale signs of a liar or somebody who doesn't care about me because they're, they're ghosting me or they're ignoring me or whatever. Uh, hip language you want to use there. Uh, I, I can understand the times. I discern that. Yes. But uh, that's not the extent of what we're talking about. We're talking about a spiritual enterprise of discernment here that is to be distinguished from a spiritual gift. We'll talk about this, but this is something that Christians, every Christian has the obligation to do. It's something that all believers are commanded to participate in. So having discernment is simply being equipped to evaluate whether something is good or true. And all Christians are commanded to participate in this. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 24, Paul tells the believers there in Thessalonica, test everything, test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So there you seem to recognize that this, that this is a general command to everybody to, to be able to test things. And the context there may be prophecy, but even if we expand it beyond prophecy, the point is that you need to evaluate things, whether, whether they are good or evil and whether they are from God or not. Similarly, in 1 John 4, 1, he addresses the church saying, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So what's really important here is assessing this idea of, uh, and and this is really important because in the church, uh, Christians are never just to take something wholesale from the preacher or from anyone who, who just says, oh, you believe me, I speak for God, whatever. That wasn't even how the Old Testament uh, nation of Israel was to function either. They were told that you have to test what the prophets say in accordance with what God has previously revealed, Deuteronomy 13, and in accordance with what they say, Deuteronomy 18. So if Deuteronomy 18 says that if what they say doesn't come to pass, they're a false prophet, and Deuteronomy 13 says even if they're working signs and wonders, and yet they... They say something that contradicts what I've said previously. They are not a true prophet. So there was always to be an evaluation, a judging of what people say, of what they're doing to ascertain whether or not they're actually speaking for God. And so this, who can practice discernment? Well, every Christian participates in this. First John 4, 1 talks about that. First Thessalonians 5, as well as many others passages. Because remember, all the passages that talk about judging uh, are ubiqu- ubiquitous to believers in the church. And so we understand that within the church, we are to be wise, we're to be discerning, we're to evaluate these things. And one further step beyond that is that as we think about why Christians are to do this, it's because discernment is a spirit-sourced activity, which only Christians can participate in. Now, as I said, there is a general sense in which unbelievers do have access to wisdom as God gives common grace. We understand that. But this is this is a, a truly spiritual enterprise, which which we even talked about in first uh, first Corinthians two fourteen, that verse where it says the natural person, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, that phrase alone does not accept. I think I've mentioned this maybe in prior episodes. I feel like I go to this verse a lot with regard to understanding anthropology. It's very, very important. This verse, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, along with Romans 1, are so foundational to having an apologetic methodology, understanding anthropology. And in reality... Uh, What this verse is saying is that the natural person does not accept the things of God. So this isn't this, this part of the phrase is not talking about ability. It's talking about willful rejection. So he does not accept, he does not receive, he, he rejects it. 
Okay, so this is this is something where an antagonistic spirit is on display here. The natural person, the person who's un, an unbeliever, rejects the things of God because he hates the things of God. He's he is a he's a unbeliever. Now, notice the explanation here that's given is for they are folly to him. In other words, he looks at it. He comes under the assessment that these things are foolish. And so now the second part of the phrase also couples with this willful antagonism that's going on there, the inability. And so Paul explains in the second half here, he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So now we have the ability. So not only is he willfully rejecting, but he's, he's even incapable of understanding because they are spiritually judged or spiritually discerned. And then the next verse talks about how the spiritual person judges all things. So what we're, what we're understanding in assessing this scripture here is that the natural person, the unbeliever, is incapable of exercising spiritual wisdom, spiritual judgment here. But the Christian can, because he's indwelt by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God guides him in that process of discerning and judging. Okay, so that now that doesn't mean that a Christian is going to be perfect. There's ways to grow and and improve that judgment and discernment. And we'll talk about that. Just like every Christian has the obligation to grow in their self-control, in their in their self-control over anger or or their their uh, control over gluttony. All these different aspects of our sanctification are on full display. But we need to understand that that this is a spiritual enterprise. Now, it should also be di- differentiated from 1 Corinthians 12.10. In 1 Corinthians 12.10, we are told that there are, there are gifts of prophecy and distinguishing between spirits. And some of the older translations, I think it was the KJV and New King James Version in 1 Corinthians 12.10, translated that phrase as discerning between spirits. And so some people would uh, call this uh, or, or would recognize a, a spiritual gift of discernment. And I, I'm not going to deny that there is spirit involvement in discernment. That's what we're reading in 1 Corinthians 2. But what I think is being targeted in 1 Corinthians 12, 10 is not just a generic gift of discernment or the ability to judge, but this is specifically targeting in the gift of prophecy. There is a element where 1 Corinthians 14 says the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. In other words, what's being mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 as couplets, there is that you have prophecy and the ability to determine whether the prophecy is from God or not. Those are two sides of the same gift, as it were. Uh, Similarly, you have mentioned in the very uh, immediate context there, gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So in other words, the, the gift of speaking... Uh, in tongues and the gift of interpreting the tongues are connected, obviously. And so the gift of speaking prophecy and then distinguishing between the spirits of the prophets is also a, a united uh, package deal, as it were. So I think First Corinthians twelve ten, even though some have have tried to point to that as a special spiritual gift of discernment. Um, I, I, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I think that's talking about a, a spiritual gift that's related to prophecy, just like the interpretation of tongues is related to tongues. So I just wanted to clarify that, and perhaps that could be more of a future episode at some other point. But I just wanted to clarify that all believers have this obligation of discernment, where we are to judge and evaluate circumstances, individuals, and that's part, part of what we need to, how we need to participate in that. Now, I want to add at that point um, what the purpose of discernment is. If we think about why we're trying to be discernment or, or how we should assess um, these, these aspects, um, what the goal is in, in trying to evaluate and discern, I think th- there are a couple of reasons, but I want to zero in on two. So the first thing I want to zero in, in on are the, is the fact that enemies are a danger within the church, not primarily without the church. So what I mean by that is, is the most damage that comes to the church comes from those who are within the church. Yeah, there's persecution that takes place from external sources and all that, to be sure. But the 
most significant damage that comes among believers are those people who claim to be, be believers and who teach error or falsehood, false teachers. And Paul talks about that in Acts 20. And I think that's one of the most important passages to understand with regard to church leadership, um, just how the church should function, and even the the things that the church ought to be cautious for in the future. And Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders for the last time. And in verses 29 and 30, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So notice how that is being spelled out here is he's saying, I know that after I leave you, there's going to come these fierce wolves among the sheep. You know, the, the picture there is is grotesque and, and uh, shocking uh, intentionally. And he's saying there are going to be people that come from yourselves, from your own selves, there will arise people. That's one of the saddest, darkest, most discouraging verses in all of scriptural, probably because the reality is that from among the church itself is going to arise these false teachers who are going to twist things and draw away disciples after them. And so he, he that's why he's motivated to tell them this and to say, be on your guard, be on your guard against these things. Now, if we uh, put what Jesus said in Matthew 7, along with this, in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about false teachers and false prophets. And in Matthew seven fifteen through 20, he targets these false prophets, these false teachers, and says, Beware of them who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So Jesus, too, just like Paul, warned people about false teachers, false prophets. We ought to be on our guard. This is a constant theme through the New Testament saying you need to watch out for false teachers. They are dangerous. And what Jesus says is really helpful. In verse 16, he says, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. Later on in verse 18, he says, A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So you can recognize a false teacher by the fruit which he produces. The, the things that, that flow from his life will, will help you discern whether or not he is a man of the truth uh, in some cases, a woman of the truth, uh, depending on their influence on the church. You can have false teachers be both men and women, certainly. And so th this is really important for believers. So the purpose of discernment is to guard against these false teachers, these false prophets, which come from within. Because, and, and just on personal testimony, I, I always like to tell people that some of the craziest things I've seen are, you know, at these, at these, uh, church Bible studies, every once in a while, you'll get people passing around books that are just filled with garbage. And, and even, uh, you know, I, I say this out of, you know, motivated love to be sure is that I see people who go into Christian bookstores because they have a Christian name on there and just think that everything in there is golden. And I always try to warn people and say, you go into a Christian bookstore and I'd say, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the material in a Christian bookstore is going to be garbage most of the time. I mean, that's just the, the way of life. Uh, you have so many people who are teaching worthless things and trying to make money or trying to build a following or whatever. Uh, and it's and it's just really sad. And so discernment is so important. And so enemies come from within. They they bear the name Christian. They don't they don't advertise the fact that they are they are not Christian or that they are antagonistic to Christianity. So that's the first reason why discernment is so important. The second reason would be to avoid deception and be grounded in the truth. So this is obviously related to the prior reason to avoid deception and be grounded in the truth. And Ephesians 4 is, is great with this because in Ephesians 4, we have the purpose of the church. In verse 11, we're told by the Apostle Paul that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And then this was done in verse 12 to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ 
until we all attain to the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. So that was the, the purpose and goal. Now in verse 14, we have a continuation of this for why this is so important. So the building up of believers within the church. Why is this so important? How, uh, what, is the, what is the purpose of this process? Well, verse 14 spells it out for us. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So in other words, what Paul is saying is that if you want to avoid being carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning or deception, craftiness, deceitful schemes, do you want to avoid that? Well, you need to immerse yourself in the ministry of the apostles, prophets, shepherds, and teachers, evangelists, all of those individuals have equipped us through their ministry in the word, and that builds us up to maturity. And through that maturity, that understanding of the fullness of Christ and what scripture speaks to, then that will be the gateway, that will be the means through which we avoid this deception and we can be grounded in the truth. So the purpose of discernment is to avoid being like, you know, a little child, just going wherever we, wherever whim takes us, wherever the winds blow. Discernment is very important to understand what is essential, what scripture does teach, and to be able to focus on the fundamentals. Discernment really is essential with regard to that. So having, having kind of painted that picture of who needs to practice discernment, all believers, and what's the purpose of discernment, protecting the integrity of the church, allow, allowing ourselves to be grounded in the truth and not, not prone to deception. So how do we, how do we grow in discernment? I think this is the practical aspect of thinking through discernment. How do we grow in discernment? And one of the things that, that came up in, in thinking through this, uh, cause you know, I, I've talked about this informally with many people. I've, I've engaged in some really lively and helpful discussions. And like I mentioned earlier, I, I did done a Bible study recently on this issue as well. And one of the things that I think is helpful to talk about with regard to how we grow in discernment, how we practice it is, is clarifying what is not to be expected of a believer. And one of the things that I think we're all tempted to do in a certain in a certain capacity, is to mistake discernment, the, the ability to think, judge, and evaluate, uh, to, to mistake that for having God reveal a sign to us. And, and let me explain how this might work. Like, let's say you're trying to discern um, whether or not you ought to go to a certain church, or let's say you're trying to discern whether or not you're to take a certain job. And you're trying to evaluate that. You're trying to judge that and discern the ramifications. And so you, you know, read the story of Gideon or something like that. And you might say, all right, Lord, if you want me to take this job, please allow somebody to call me between the times of 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. this next morning, because then I will know that that's the job I should take. And if not, I won't take that job. And you will clearly have led me. You know, we could we could set up a scenario like that. But there's a couple things to be warned about with regard to that. The story of Gideon, as as you read through it here in Judges 6 and, and think through the life of Gideon, there are quite a few problems with Gideon. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, there, there's a lot to appreciate about Gideon, I think. Um, I, I'm not so... Uh, so spoiled against Gideon that I wouldn't give him his due. He definitely has some things to merit. Uh, but at the same time, holistically, there are also some problems, as is the case throughout all uh, characters of Scripture. But especially in the book of Judges, we, we see many characteristics like this, where Gideon, for example, ends his life by leading Israel into idolatry, pursuing the ephod, which he makes uh, later. And so here too, when in Judges 6, when he's trying to, to ask God for a sign, he's, it says specifically, let me test you this once more. He's using the same word for testing that comes from Deuteronomy 7, where, where it says, you shall not test the Lord your God. So in other words, Gideon is very much testing God, even though God had said, don't do that. 
but I just think that's an element of God's mercy. The other thing I like to point out to people is that if you contrast the stories of Judges 6 and 7, how, how it plays out, and you contrast it with like Matthew 4 and the temptation narrative where Satan is tempting Jesus, the constructions there, the grammatical constructions, and even the same terminology is used where Satan will say, if you are this, or if you will do this, then do this so that we know it's true. And that's the same way that Gideon talks, saying like, if you will save Israel by my hand, then do this so that I know that this is true. Now, God doesn't doesn't have mercy on Satan's request at all. He just says to him uh, in uh, quoting Deuteronomy 7, he says, you shall not test the Lord your God. You shall not put him to the test. And yet with Gideon, he, he allows Gideon to do that. I don't think Gideon is in the right doing that. I think that's the merciful providence of God, the merciful provision of God in being kind to Gideon, although Gideon is acting in a way that is not to be followed. Now, why do I make a mention of that? Because nowhere in scripture are we taught to seek signs like that. We are taught to seek wise counsel in making decisions through the abundance of counselors, plans succeed. We are taught to to discern and to judge rightly or to do exercise righteous judgment. All these things are the Christian enterprise, but nowhere are we taught to seek special signs or communication from God in making decisions or evaluations about people or circumstances. And so if that's our mindset of what discernment looks like or how we are to practice it and grow, then we're definitely on the wrong foot. And so I would definitely challenge challenge you if that's kind of how you've been thinking about God. And I had, I had a really good follow-up conversation with somebody when we were talking about this because they kind of were thinking about that and they realized that if if you ask God to fulfill your expectation of a sign in a certain way to guide and direct you, basically what you're telling God to do is this is what you must do or not do to communicate to me. In other words, what you're doing is you're putting God in a box, mandating that the creator of the universe needs to communicate with you and uh, c- commune with you, fellowship with you in a, in a special way that you dictate. That's that's pretty sketchy. I mean, I, I would be very, very scared um, saying that God must communicate me in this way, specifically in order for me to understand. That... That, that's pretty, especially when there's no biblical warrant for that. Remember, the, people will go to the story of Gideon a lot of times, but the thing I always say is the story of Gideon, it's uh, description, not prescription, right? And so we need to be careful building a theology of discernment or a theology of understanding God's will from that narrative. So how do we grow in discernment then? What are ways that we can practically understand how to make wiser decisions, how to grow in our ability to judge things? Well, I think maybe the starting point has to be praying for discernment. I think, I think Philippians 1.9 is, is a good example of that where Paul is praying for the Philippian believers and he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and all discernment. So it's, and I think it's also a helpful side observation there that uh, Paul seems to draw a distinction between uh, the, the cultural connotations of love, where love is equal to acceptance, but Paul couples love with the idea of discernment. So in other words, he says that you may abound in love more and more, but with knowledge and discernment. In other words, this ability to uh, not just accept everything, but that love may be in accordance with the truth. And so regardless, I think the starting point is that we ought to be praying for discernment. We ought to be praying that God would help us grow, just like we pray that we would be more loving individuals, just like we pray that we would be holy, just like we pray that we would be able to control our our temper, that we would be able to trust God more, that he would increase our faith. Well, this same idea is prevalent in this nature of discernment. We grow asking God to fulfill that. And of course, that's in accordance with his will. And so he will answer that prayer in the affirmative if we ask him to. So we pray for discernment. That's definitely a way to start. The other major uh, aspect in which we can grow in discernment is to remove the world's influence and immerse yourself in the biblical worldview. 
So I, I draw here from Romans 12, but it's it's a principle found throughout Scripture. But Romans 12, very specifically in verse 2, says, Do not be conformed to this world. So don't let yourself be conformed to this world. Don't let yourself be immersed in its influence. But in contrast to that, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing, there's that idea of judgment and testing again, there's overlap in how those are translated, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So in other words, what what Paul is keying in here in verse 2 of chapter 12 in Romans is he's saying that you need to get rid of the world's influence, you need to not be conformed to this world, and you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which happens through the the applicability of God's word, constantly being immersed and dwelling on that. That's how our hearts change. Now, as I think about this, I, I think we, we've seen this in our culture. Uh, Hollywood is the greatest cultural influence. People's consciences are being shaped by Hollywood every day. Every movie they watch, every... Uh, TV show that they that they watch, they are being influenced to have a certain understanding of what some uh, of what is right, what is wrong, and that's the primary influence. And shame on us as Christians if we allow that to be our primary influence as well. We ought not to be looking at this world and allowing that to be our conforming nature. You know, I've talked with even. I've talked with believers that I really, really appreciate and, you know, have just been sometimes disappointed by just how they even allow, allow the worldview of the culture to just seep into the fact that they're using the same language that the world is using. They're thinking about things the same way. That's not how we learned Christ. That's not how we are to think. We are to grow in our discernment by removing the world's influence and understanding that it's an anti-God worldview and allowing the biblical truth to formulate our definitions, to formulate the way we process things. All of those things are very important for us. And then thirdly, this is just very practical levels for how to grow in in maturity and knowledge. Uh, You practice. You practice. And here I draw on Hebrews 5. There, and this is one of the, the best verses on discernment that we have uh, in Scripture. In Hebrews 5, you have the author of Hebrews kind of chewing out uh, the people that he's writing to because they, they are eating milk and not solid food. And so he says in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature. But he's hoping they get to that point. Um, and he's saying they're not at that point yet, but he's saying they should have been. And so he says in verse 14, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now, notice the key phrase there, constant practice. Okay, so just on a very practical level, there are ways that you practice discernment. And it's by always being aware that this is what's going on when you're reading books, when you're watching movies. There should never be something where... You know, this, I know this is going to sound crazy to some, to some people, but it's really important is that you should never approach the culture or anything uncritically when you're listening to a sermon, when you're listening to, uh, news, when you're watching movies, all these things, there should be a, a switch that is always on with a critical ear. Not now that doesn't mean you have to be negative on everything, but you should always be critical saying, is that true? Is that true? Is that true? And that's part of our, part of our standard. Just as, just as an example of that, the Bereans in Acts 17 were known for this. Uh, Paul blessed them and praised them. Um, well, actually Luke did in Acts, um, because of when Paul was preaching, Luke said that the Bereans were noble and they were searching the scriptures to see if the things that Paul taught were true. So yes, even the great apostle Paul was being double checked by the Bereans and they were praised for it as they searched scripture. So it doesn't matter who your pastor is, who uh, is teaching you, you always double check. You always ascertain through scripture what's going on. And so how you do that? Well, number one, you read your Bible. We've talked about that uh, with regard to Romans 12 too. You immerse yourself in scripture. You That is the thing where you 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 understand, you learn, and allow scripture to influence your life. 
But also, number two would be you read books and articles by quality authors. So one of the things that God has instituted in humanity is that we model ourselves after those we value and trust. Uh, Paul even says this in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Philippians 3. He says, identify those who are living godly, imitate their faith. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, he also says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So as human beings, we it's not wrong to imitate one another. So you find people that are godly representatives to imitate. And as you read their books, you listen to them, you, you learn from them, you watch them, you learn how to do things by watching. It's kind of like any teacher, all those, all those wonderful teachers who win teacher of the year or whatever, students are mimicking them. They, they look at them. They don't just learn a subject material, but they learn about how to live, how to process, how to, how to, how to function. And so that's, that's what parents, teachers are supposed to do in their lives is they model these aspects and those who are learning, growing and maturing, they need to model themselves after those. So find people, you know, there, there are certain people that I, that I just really love seeing their name as the author on a book, because I know that I'm going to really benefit. Now, it again, doesn't mean that I'm not going to be critical and I'm not going to disagree on some things because I am, but at the same time, I'm going to really appreciate the way that they do things. And I'm going to learn how to do things better by seeing that modeled. So read good books and articles by quality authors. I would say number three, listen to quality sermons or podcasts. I mean, we live in such a, a age of abundance where you can listen to audiobooks. You know, a lot of people have told me in the past, oh, I'm just not a reader. I'm just not a reader. Well, listen, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if you're not a reader in today's age. Everything's on audiobook now. So you can't tell me that you're not a listener because you are a listener. Everybody listens. Okay. Everybody listens and engages in conversations. Um, so at this point, if you're not doing things to grow by listening or reading to things, you're just lazy and you and I need to have a different kind of conversation. So you need to be listening to quality material, okay? And you can do both. Now, it'd be really interesting if you could do both at the same time, reading a different book and listening to something else. It's possible. It's been tried, I suppose. But I don't know. Give me, give me, you can, you can tell me if you do that and I will ask you all about your amazing talents. I just, the point being, there's just so much material out there to benefit from. We need to do that. Now, here's another thing to do. So number four would be to practice reading things that you disagree with. Now, a lot of people aren't so keen on this. They they just love to read things that tickle their ears or that they agree with or that make them feel good. But I think it's actually really helpful to read things that you don't agree with. And can you boil it down to what it is that you don't agree with? What is it? Is it just that you don't like the tone of voice? You know, just because you don't like someone doesn't mean that they're wrong. And just because you like someone, even more dangerously, just because you like someone doesn't mean that they're right. And so that's something that we need to do. And, and honestly, that's one of the areas where I think that we've really, really faltered. Uh, it just we've lost the ability to disagree and to to pinpoint where the disagreements are. We'll try the just little soundbite responses or whatever, but we don't actually take the pains to understand the arguments and understand what is what is wrong or what is what is off with these issues. And so I think it's really, really helpful to read things that you disagree with and and to practice working through that saying, well, why is this wrong? And I think that that's that's helpful. Now, I also think that I also think that should be done with caution. Like I, I think that you need you need to be immersed in Scripture and to be ground. The Ephesian four grounding needs to be real, right? You need to be mature and growing. Otherwise, if you read some things, you will be just swept away, and you will have no way of discerning that. So this is this is a dangerous enterprise, and yet this is how you do grow in maturity. You do. It's kind of like any any workouts that go on any. Um, you know, nobody's going to just jump into the gym and, and bench press 400 pounds. I mean, uh, I suppose some have tried that and there have probably been some premature deaths in the weight room because of that. But uh, needless to say, you work up to it. You you work up the resistance. At first, you're starting to do push-ups, then you do other things and you, you slowly build up. And that's how that's how maturity works as well in in the Christian biblical 
enterprise is that you don't just like rush into uh, you know all heresies or anything like that, but you slowly train your your ability to discern and to evaluate those things. But you have to know scripture to be able to do that, and you have to be able to think through those things. But that is a legitimate and important way uh, through which you grow. Now, the last one that we could talk about just from a practical standpoint, there are probably many others, but just for sake of time, the last one I think would be also invite arguments into your life to challenge you. So so make sure that you, you are trying to learn from friends that disagree with you and, and ask lots of questions. Uh, and, you know, I think that that, you know, this used to be a really, a really fun thing in life. Uh, you read about, you know, the older generations and they would actually oftentimes talk and disagree with one another. And they would have these these debates and they would still be friends after. Right. And I think that's really, really healthy. And it, it helps sharpen you because you you're learning to think more critically, to analyze things and to be more discerning. And who knows, you may be persuaded by a good, legitimate biblical argument or you may persuade your friend and and all of those things are helpful and healthy. And so I think you shouldn't shun from arguments, you know. I don't know where this rule came from. You remember the you know the rule nowadays which is like you can't talk about religion or politics or whatever in in social circles. I think that's the dumbest rule in the world. I think that's that's just so insane. Why wouldn't you talk about things that are so important? I mean religion is obviously primary, but politics really is well, as it is now, especially, it's just an outflowing of your theological convictions. And so those things are healthy conversations and they're, they're helpful conversations to have. And so that helps you practice growing in your maturity and knowledge and therefore in your ability to discern and judge and evaluate. So I think that's, that's very important. Now, last but not least, one thing that I think that's helpful to ask with regard to discernment is what role do your feelings play in discernment? What role do the feelings play? And I know, I know this isn't always uh, well received, but I, I just want to say it this way: feelings are largely irrelevant, if not completely irrelevant, to the to the area of discernment. And I already mentioned this, but but you can have many people who feel that oh, I just can't trust that guy, or I don't like him. And yet the person's argument may be completely true. They may be speaking the truth about what scripture means. And you may have somebody that just has the best smile. They're just, you just feel the warmth and the love radiating from them. And they're just a horrendous false teacher. I can give two examples specifically. I won't give names, but just by way of personal experience, I can give two examples that I'm thinking of in my mind where I've experienced both of those, where there was one individual who was just very generous, very kind, and I just, he was such a people person. And he ended up becoming a CEO of a major company, which you would probably recognize. And I just remember uh, hearing him teach in a Bible study. And I remember thinking like, okay, like I could, I could understand why this, this person is so, is so well liked and respected by everybody. And yet, as as I was discerning some of the arguments, I realized that he was teaching some very serious error, divisive error. And I ended up talking to a couple other pastors in the area, and they said that, you know, this individual was was well known for causing major divisions. And he was he was marked as a as a false teacher. And yet it was very clear that he was a charismatic individual, had many people under his sway. Now, on the flip side of that. I remember uh, sitting in a Bible study with uh, an individual and uh, this this illustration has probably taken place multiple times in my life because I can think of like three or four more other people for this. But my first instinct of certain individuals was like, I don't like this person or I, I just I have a bad feeling about this. Something just doesn't sit right about this individual to me. And yet my feelings were misplaced and ultimately they end up becoming a really good friend of mine. And you know, it's funny because, you know, I just look back and I think, oh, how stupid. Why did I have those feelings? And that's the thing is, is feelings uh, can be caused by so many different var- variables. And so they're largely irrelevant. Uh, the objective truth of the matter is, is, you know, what is this person teaching? What is, what is the basis of, 
their argument, all these, all these scenarios. Uh, and also just thinking about making, making decisions, uh, like what kind of job you're going to, you're going to be in all those things. Well, yeah, feelings are not completely irrelevant. That's why I say you should never do something you don't want to do, uh, with regard to pursuing a career if you have other options and, and all of that. But at the same time, we need to understand that, that feelings are fickle and that false teachers make a habit of preying on feelings just by way of illustration in, because I've done a lot of uh, research into gay Christianity and things like that. Uh, one of the main arguments that is utilized in the gay Christian community to say, Hey, you have to expect, or you have to accept, uh, gay Christians as they are, et cetera. Uh, what they will do is they will appeal to the emotions first because that, that is much, much, safer uh, or easier. It's really the only way you can't uh, gay Christianity will never win on a objective level. It will never win in an objective, uh, object, objective evaluation of the truth. It will only win by appealing to the emotions. So the emotion, the emotions will say, Jesus said, we need to love our neighbor as ourself. Let's focus on that as the primary starting point. Now, is it loving for us if we don't allow uh, so-and-so to be happy by being in a relationship, they don't have an option to be in a heterosexual relationship like you or I. So is it really loving to take away something from them that wouldn't harm you or me? Is that really loving? Well, see, that's the argument is it's all emotionally driven and there's no objectivity about what is right, what is wrong, what is, how has God designed the world? What does he hold us to? Those are the primary questions and yet they're completely ignored on the basis of emotional argumentation. And so those are the primary means which false teachers will utilize to bring us into a conflict of ideology. So thinking through all this, We've, we've le learned that discernment ultimately is just judging. So when somebody says next time, you can't judge me, well, by God's grace, we need to understand I need to judge them, not as a hypocrite, but as a Christian. I need to be wise and evaluate and discern whether or not this individual is saying the, telling the truth, whether this individual is teaching the truth, whether this individual's character lines up with what it means to be a Christian. That is the biblical responsibility. And by God's grace, we can participate in this as we ought to not, not overly critical. And I, I should, I should conclude by noting this, that first Corinthians four, one to five is very clear that we can't, we can't judge motives. Judging motives is almost impossible. And so Paul there also says, do not judge before the time, but the context of what he's saying there is saying, judge the motivations. You can't judge the motivations. You, you don't know whether or not I'm doing what I'm doing for a good reason or for a bad reason, a righteous reason or an unrighteous reason. You can't see on the surface level. You can only evaluate the objective reality of what I'm doing. But motivations are very, very difficult to see. We can't see the heart that way. And so that's where we need to, we need to be careful about whether we say like, oh, this person is so godly. They're doing so many good things. Well, we don't know exactly why they're doing those things. And, and that's why we, we don't want to rob God of the glory and just say like how awesome people are when we don't, we don't actually see the, the motivations. And so Paul actually brings that up. And I think one of the main reasons Paul brings that up in first Corinthians four, one to five is because he's, he's trying to put the kibosh on people praising him for what he's doing. And he's saying, listen, don't judge me because you don't know my heart. And I don't even know my heart. That's Paul's point too, is I'm, I'm not even in a correct place to evaluate whether or not I'm doing a good job or not, because our hearts are mixed. We are, uh, we're deceived by the only way, the only way that we, uh, do things. We, we don't have a, a, a perfect knowledge of, of how we're processing these things. So all those things are important to keep in mind as we try to be uh, Christians that are that are discerning, that are good at judging in the biblical sense of what that means. So I hope that's helpful. It's maybe a little different tact than what we've talked about in the past, but I think it's important, helpful, and I hope it's uh, going to be encouraging to you as you try to continue to grow your discernment and maturity. If you're interested in more articles that I've written or other podcasts, you can go to petergaiman.com. If you're interested in Shepherd's Theological Seminary, you can visit shepherds.edu. Until next time, 
May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.